Interstellar travel is a challenging proposition to say the least. There are an entire host of issues that need to be solved in order to make this possible, especially for a crude voyage rather than just sending a satellite to retrieve data. If we aim to make this dream a reality, something that is often considered to be mandatory for the continued survival and growth of humans as a species, then the most important hurdle that we need to tackle is propulsion. Each different form of space travel carries with it different challenges in terms of the health and safety of the crew, but our main goal is to make these trips take the least amount of time possible. Let's say that our goal is to reach Alpha Centauri, the closest star system to Earth. It's only a little more than four light years away in a universe that is tens of billions of light years in diameter, so in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem that far. However, using conventional rockets would mean it would take tens of thousands of years to reach Alpha Centauri, and that's assuming that it would even be possible using conventional fuel. The more fuel a ship carries, the more its mass increases, and thus the more fuel is required to propel it. Because of this issue, it's argued that there may not even be enough matter in the universe to fuel a spaceship traveling from Earth to Alpha Centauri. So we're going to need a better form of propulsion, but luckily, there's plenty of options. However, it's important that scientists choose the correct one. That's not to say that they shouldn't all be researched independently to prove their viability, but it would be a waste of time and resources to focus on anything but the absolute best option, even if that means waiting longer to start our journey. It would be an incredible leap forward if 20 years from now we were able to build a spaceship that could reach Alpha Centauri in only 100 years. But if an additional 30 years of effort would be able to cut that travel time in half, then there'd be no point in launching that first spacecraft. It would be exciting and possible possibly difficult to resist launching a ship once that first hurdle was crossed, but the ship launched 30 years later would still arrive at its destination 20 years earlier, making the first ship entirely pointless. Just don't let the crew of that first ship know, especially since the final crew would have been born on the ship. But because selecting the best option is so important, it's vital that we explore all possibilities for interstellar travel. There are a lot of different ideas, but today we're going to be looking at four incredible ways that we could travel the stars. So, while we just emphasized the importance of focusing on the best option, solar sails are a bit of an exception. To start, this technology is already here. These sails were first theorized back in the 1970s, and in 2010, Japan's Icarus probe became the world's first spacecraft to use solar sails as its primary means of propulsion. Of course, that spacecraft was only a satellite rather than a crewed spaceship, and, well, that's unlikely to change with any current future projects. In reality, a solar sail isn't that different from a cloth sail used by boats. Solar sails are large sheets of reflective material designed to catch sunlight the same way that a traditional sail catches the wind. These sheets are up to a hundred times thinner than a standard piece of paper and may be as large as a kilometer in diameter. The sails are typically square-shaped and held in place using a lightweight frame that makes them resemble a kite. When photons emitted by the sun reflect off the surface of the sail, they impart a tiny force upon the sail thanks to the conservation of momentum. With enough photons striking the sail, the combined force can cause the spacecraft to accelerate Accelerate. But because acceleration is force divided by mass, moving something larger than a satellite is going to require more force. The force imparted by each individual photon will be the same, so the only way to increase the total force acting on the system is by making a larger sail that would reflect more photons. In order to move a crewed vehicle at any meaningful velocity, researchers estimate this would require a sail that was literally the size of Texas, that's roughly 700,000 square kilometers. This wouldn't be impossible to build, but it would would be a logistical nightmare. There's also another issue here, which is that relying on photons from the sun is a very slow way to travel. LightSail 2 is a satellite with a total weight of about 5 kilograms that relied on photons from the sun to accelerate. While it worked, it only accelerated at 0.058 millimeters per second squared. It would take a month of acceleration at this rate for the satellite to reach the speed of an average commercial jet. It's unlikely that solar sails will ever become the propulsion method of choice for humans to travel the stars but it may prove to be an effective method for us to explore them. There's even already a plan in place to do so, a plan that also deals with the slow acceleration that we would achieve by relying on the sun alone. Founded by Stephen Hawking, Yuri Milner, and Mark Zuckerberg, Breakthrough Starshot hopes to launch a thousand tiny satellites towards Proxima Centauri b, a potentially habitable planet in the Alpha Centauri system. These could potentially launch as early as 2036, and it should only take 20 to 30 years for the satellites to reach their destination. This means that if successful, most of you watching this will live to see the results of this test flight. 
Each satellite, called Starships, will only be one centimeter large with a weight of just a few grams. Rather than relying on light from the sun to accelerate the satellites, they instead plan to use a kilometer-squared array of ground-based lasers. These sails would accelerate each Starship one by one, and they're expected to be able to accelerate them to a speed of 15 to 20 percent the speed of light in just 10 minutes. As for why they feel the need to launch a thousand Starships with the same destination instead of exploring all over the galaxy, the answer is pretty simple. It would really suck if we only said one satellite to Proximus and Tour IB just to find out 17 years later than it crashed into a pile of space debris. While the number being deployed may be overkill based on the likelihood of such a collision actually happening, it's better safe than sorry. However, this brings up one other problem that any propulsion system for a crewed voyage needs to address, which the solar sails do not. Traveling to the destination at 20% the speed of light is fantastic, but it would be nice if we could actually stop once we get there. There's no wind resistance to slow these satellites down, so they will continue moving at that speed and soar straight past our target. Now that's fine for this particular mission, since the goal is to take high-resolution pictures of the planet's surface and send them back to Earth, something which the starships will have plenty of time to do. But it would be a major problem if the goal was to land there. As such, any crewed vessel would need to make use of the same amount of propulsion to slow down that it did to reach its top speed. But still, using the optimistic launch date of 2036, the top speed of 20% of the speed of light, and then another four years for the signals to make it back to Earth, we could have our first high-quality images of Proxima Centauri B as early as 2060. Mastering control of the atom has been one of civilization's greatest and most deadly accomplishments. Nuclear fission reactions can generate massive amounts of energy using small amounts of fuel, and fission bombs can unleash absolute devastation on a population. Yet despite being entirely rooted in science, nuclear bombs have been treated as if they have almost magical properties. Could a nuke set the entire atmosphere on fire? Could we destroy a hurricane by detonating a nuclear bomb in its center? Could we terraform Mars by nuking the shit out of it? These are all real questions that scientists have researched and uh, we can add could a nuclear missile launch a rocket into space to that list of seemingly bizarre questions. The idea was first explored in the 50s and 60s as part of Project Orion and it was an absolutely terrible idea. What makes this particular plan so spectacularly ill-advised was that they were going to start on the ground detonating a nuclear weapon here on Earth to send a ship into space. This might be technically possible but it would end horribly to start the explosion might just destroy the ship entirely. Even if it got off the ground and into space, the crew would definitely be dead. And even if it was a ship without a crew, the nuclear explosions EMP would have knocked out all of the electrical systems on the ship, leaving it as useless as a hunk of floating space junk. And that's before we even take into account the effects that the nuclear explosion and fallout could have back on Earth. However, once the ship is already in space, this becomes a theoretically less ridiculous form of propulsion known as nuclear pulse propulsion. To start, we don't really need to worry about where the radiation ends up because space is already full of dangerous radiation anyway. Also, because the ship would be moving and the bombs could be detonated at a predetermined distance away, it can be assumed that catastrophic damage either from the explosions themselves or from EMPs wouldn't be an issue. NASA, in collaboration with DARPA, is already working on an engine utilizing nuclear pulse propulsion and they're currently planning to conduct a test flight to Mars in 2027. And because nobody does cool acronyms quite like the United States military, DARPA has named this nuclear explosion-fueled spaceship Draco, or the demonstration rocket for Adjar cislunar operations. There are decades of research on nuclear pulse propulsion, but according to the most recent calculations, a ship utilizing this method of propulsion could achieve speeds of up to 10% the speed of light, so long as he had no intention of ever stopping. Since eventually stopping would require that the accelerated mass included the added weight of the fuel required to slow down, the top speed would only be 3-5% to the speed of light. Now, that's obviously still very fast, but even traveling at the high end, that would mean a trip to Alpha Centauri would take 80 years, long enough for multiple generations to be born aboard the ship. There's also the small matter that this form of propulsion is technically a violation of international law. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1996, which the United States signed, forbids nuclear detonations not only on Earth, but in space. Perhaps NASA and DARPA have obtained permission to conduct their test flight in 2027, or maybe the they figured they'd just do it anyway. When it comes to generating energy, there's nothing more effective than antimatter. The most efficient nuclear bombs will only release about 1% of their mass energy equivalent as energy, while the annihilation of matter and antimatter releases 100% of the mass energy equivalent as energy. That doesn't mean it's 100% efficient as a form of propulsion, but it would be 100% efficient at heating up and irradiating a ship's engine. 
So, well, that's a fun little design quirk that engineers are going to have to figure out. But even if 100% of that energy released can't be used to propel a vessel, it would still be the most efficient form of propulsion by far. There are all sorts of estimates for exactly how fast an antimatter rocket would be able to travel based on different ship designs, payloads of fuel, and total masses of the system. On the low end, it's estimated that an antimatter rocket would reach 40% the speed of light, while more optimistic estimates put that number as high as 94%. Either way, traveling at those speeds would allow us to reach Alpha Centauri in under a decade. That's an incredible leap forward. But how possible is it to actually construct an antimatter rocket? While the technical considerations regarding the construction of the ship and the safety of the crew are among the easier questions to deal with for this technology. They're by no means easy, and in fact represent a massive problem that we might not ever have the technology to handle, but there is a much bigger problem at hand. Where the hell are we going to get all that antimatter? Exactly how much antimatter you would need depends on the total mass of the spaceship, but most calculations put it in the thousands of tons if you want to stop at a destination instead of traveling forever. That is a massive problem, since it's not like we could just dig into the Earth's crust and mine for antimatter the way we would for iron. Antimatter particles are created naturally in the universe, but they annihilate as soon as they come into contact with matter. They are provably real particles, but they can't be harvested in massive quantities in the wild. Luckily, we do have the ability to create antimatter particles. It's just really, really hard and really expensive. If CERN's Large Hadron Collider was dedicated exclusively to making antimatter, it would only be able to generate about a billionth of a gram every year, falling well short of our thousand-ton goal. It's possible that future technology will provide a speedier and more efficient means of generating antimatter particles, but there's a limit to how efficient it can be. The key to an antimatter rocket's speed is the massive amount of energy that is released by the annihilation of antimatter and matter. However, to create such a potent fuel requires even more energy than the fuel can produce. Now, let's say you wanted to create an amount of antimatter that would release a trillion petajoules of energy upon annihilation. At minimum, the process to create that much antimatter would require two trillion petajoules of energy, double the amount that the fuel will release. The amount of energy required to create enough antimatter for our trip to Alpha Centauri is greater than 40 years worth of energy consumption by the entire world. We could always bring new power plants specifically online to power this endeavor, but it's going to be expensive, it's going to require a ton of energy, and we still would need to develop a more effective means of generating antimatter particles en masse. Of course, that's still only half the problem. Once we create these particles, we have to store them somewhere. It's not like you can just toss them in a glass jar since they annihilate on contact with matter. They need to be stored using a combination of magnetic and electric fields that prevent them from coming into contact with matter. While we have the ability to do this, it's not particularly long-term storage and has never been used for anything of meaningful mass. Currently, antimatter rockets seem like they're a long ways off, but we can at least have reason to believe that they could become practically possible. Antimatter may be rare and hard to contain, but at least we know it's real. And that brings us to our final form of travel. Antimatter may be fine for traveling to Alpha Centauri, but it's a great big universe out there. Why should we settle for only visiting the closest star system to us? And we want to get out there as fast as possible, so let's ignore the limit and travel there faster than light. This is theoretically possible, and it doesn't seem to violate any of the laws of the universe. However, it does require exotic matter, theorized particles that might exist, but also just might not exist. So how does the Alcubierre warp drive work, especially if it's supposed to be impossible to move faster than the speed of light? Well, the answer is by simply not moving at all. Proposed by theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubier, the drive would create a warp bubble of flat spacetime around the ship. Rather than moving the ship through space, the ship would move space around the bubble. By contracting spacetime in front of the warp bubble, then expanding the spacetime back to normal behind it, the Alcubier drive uh, would essentially create a massive wave that the warp bubble would float along on. This is theoretically possible because special relativity says no matter can move faster than the speed of light through the vacuum of space, but this speed limit does not extend to the vacuum of space itself. Spacetime can move as fast as it wants, and from the ship's point of view, it would be completely stationary within its own bubble of spacetime, even if the bubble
bubble was being moved at incredible speeds. It's possible this would be absolutely fantastic. Building the warp drive itself is going to be a major challenge, assuming it's even possible, but designing the ship shouldn't actually be that difficult. Because the ship is stationary relative to the space-time it's inhabiting, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about how many g-forces it would experience or all the extra radiation that a ship would encounter when moving at extreme speeds. And while not a design concern, the ship would be interestingly free from relativistic effects, like time dilation. But as we said, the major downside of this drive is that it's the sort of thing that may only ever work on paper. It requires both exotic matter and negative energy to work, all of which is entirely theoretical. We also have no idea how to create a warp bubble. Alcabier described how the system would work if it existed, and showed that it could theoretically work without breaking physics, but, well, that's hardly a blueprint, is it? And even if we figured out how to create such a warp bubble and send it along its merry way, there's no guarantee that we'd ever get the ship back out. So look, the universe is a big place, and humans are extremely anxious to explore as much of it as we can. While there are a lot of options on how we could go about this, ranging from practical solutions that we could enact now to fanciful ideas that may not even be possible, it's going to take time. As it stands currently, our best bet is likely to just continue working on solutions to this problem until 2060, when we hopefully receive a high-res image of Proxima Centauri b from all of those little starships. While the planet is in its star's habitable zone and is believed to be one of the best options for colonization, its proximity to its star has made it impossible for us to get any good images of the planet. Once those images arrive, we'll at least be able to decide if the planet is actually worth visiting or if we should be setting our sights on somewhere else. Thank you.